great to have you all with us. Um, and thank you to Manuela and Carlo Russell um, for being here today. Um, we're joined by Carlo McCormick, um, famed critic and curator, artist Manuela Filiacci, and, and artist Russell Sharon. And we're going to talk about um, the world of art that Luis and Russell created um, going all the way back to the early 80s. Um, and Carlo is going to be our um, moderator. And Katie will be assisting with visual images. So take it away, guys. Thanks, Hal. Um, uh, and thanks, everyone who joins us. Katie, thank you for uh, putting together this incredible slideshow. Uh, if uh, I just think it's nice to have eye candy for people. Uh, but uh, if anyone, if Russell or Manuela want to make any comments about the work, we can just you know do, do that at any time. And also, thanks, Katie, for uh, corralling all of us together. Uh, it's a little bit like herding cats, but but cats who, like old grumpy cats that don't have any idea what the internet is. So you've, you've been noble on it. Uh, uh, Russell and Manuela, I'm really, uh, really happy to, to talk to you uh, both. Uh, not simply because you're really good artists whose work I, I admire, but because I think maybe in the ever expansion and professionalization of the art world, we have so many voices out there we have you know the critics and the scholars and the historians and the curators and the gallerists and the collectors and those people who make money by connecting people to art like i think they're called advisors or something and and it's not like artists are, are the mute singers in the room but there's so many people talking about art and i think it's really great to actually hear artists talk to each other about art and the reason I bring that up is because to me, it's, a, it's an incredible kind of conversation that exists be between both of you and, and, and Luis, because I mean, we could call like Luis a classicist and Russell a naturalist and Manuela an abstractionist or whatever, but you're all coming at it from a you know, very different visual language yet you painting itself as a common language. And, and I, I thought maybe you, you could share like what that conversation's about, uh, how you communicated the essence of your art to artists who weren't necessarily doing the same things and, and how that formed. Does that make any sense? Not okay. really. <laughs> so we, communicated. <laughs> we communicated more just by being with each other and, and looking at the artwork and you, you communicate with the spirit of the work. I think because it's very difficult to explain. You can explain what you're doing. I'm painting an air or that sort of thing, but you can't really uh, communicate verbally where it's coming from, you know, where, because it's coming from the spirit of art somehow there's a mystery behind it, but some of the work you really relate to. Some artists speak to, speak to you through their work or through their spirit. And those are, that's really how you communicate, whether, whether you uh, like how you get to know their work. They don't, it's very hard to explain the work if you don't have an image of the work or an example of the work to look at, you know, but uh, you know what I mean? You have to see it because it, it's not a verbal, it's not a written, unless you're a writer, it's, uh, you explain it, but you need to see it in order to feel it, the visual pieces. And some of them, uh, for me anyway, I see something in it. So it's like an on and off switch, it's true or false, you know? 
it's a personal thing. I can see if it's honest or if it isn't, or I feel it. Maybe I'm getting the wrong feeling, but for me, it's the right feeling because that's what it is. Authentic or not authentic. And it, uh, it hits really fast. And I don't know where that comes from. It comes from every, everything, I guess, my past and my, but there's a spirit that somehow, or a hunch or whatever that uh, will, Tell, tells me I get it or not. Either I got it or I don't get it. That's what it tells. Right. Yeah, I think. Either I don't get it. <laughs> I, I but think... this image, the image now, I remember when Luis was doing this cardboard piece, it's huge, in our, in our loft on uh, Dwayne Street. I don't know where that sculpture is but it took up almost the entire room and he uh he did a couple of them but this was the major one the mickey mouse and he used donald duck manuela uh can you talk a little bit about this conversation because you've always presented yourself a little bit as an outsider to me which i never quite bought but uh that's how you felt can, can you talk about uh you know, what, what you would glean from Luis or from Russell and, and vice versa in terms of practice and, and, and how art communicates. Actually, what Russell said, it's very true. We, uh, you had a feeling about the work and the person. Uh, it was a human connection to, that we had with some people. With some, you couldn't, but with some, it was very strong. And I must say that with Luis and Russell too, and some others, but I think there was this spirit that uh, one could get it in the work, the, the authenticity, the, the, and the trust, we trusted each other, I think, whatever one was doing. Um, and that's why we, we accepted. Uh, I mean, my work was very different than Luis or Russell. And yet there was something that I felt was linking everything. And we liked each other, probably. Yeah. That's, the, that's the thing. So, but in every work, I think there is a level. And for the viewer, too. There are some viewers that just don't get it. And some viewer that, uh, you know, is like seeing something that they recognize. Uh, and some just don't. Uh, we need a, the viewer to, to understand uh, what we're doing. Because um, many times, you know, you do something and it's absolutely overlooked or not taken into consideration. But I think with Russell and Louise, I always uh, saw these very important things, you know, this uh, authenticity, this uh, desire of uh, this poetry too, it, it definitely in, in Russell, a lot of poetry, and Louise more of a master, more of a, and, uh, and they helped each other, the two of them. With me, I love to look at them and to get what I could. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's interesting you you kind of bring up also just this notion of supporting each other. And, and I think uh, yes. this is something that, that artist communities need to keep close to their heart uh, because there's so much of this is put up as a kind of competitive uh, structure. Yeah. But uh, I think at, at least at that time, uh, it was pretty good. I mean, there, there were animosities or jealousies or, or different things in that. But it was by and large uh, a pretty um, supportive uh, community. And I think I see that happening plenty of times in different places. Uh, I, maybe from, from that thought, we can talk a little bit, you know, cause we're trying to conjure a place and a time uh, and some people uh, that it's all pretty distant, but, uh, you know, I guess in the, in the fifties, uh, Clement Greenberg wrote that if you uh, if you cared about art or you wanted to be an artist or anything like that, you, you basically had to live in New York, and, and that really held for a long time. And uh, I don't think it does anymore. But uh, 
uh, we were still kind of of that time, but that's the kind of macro view of New York. And then there's a, all these micro things happen in terms of the art world and its migrations in New York. So uh, if we're talking about the early eighties, you know, it, Soho is still a kind of a, a semi-dominant hegemony, but uh, we're all connected a little bit through the East Village, but Manuela, you live in, God, we didn't have a name for that neighborhood now. Is it, is it called uh, Chelsea now? What, 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 where, where exactly would you? you know? I guess between Chelsea and the village, I suppose. Yeah, so. people are calling yeah. it East Chelsea or something. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> and, then, and then very Russell- Very good for subways, not... very good for subways. Yes, it's good <laughs> for subways. Uh, <laughs> And Russell, you and Luis were down like first and kind of towards a financial district, but then I remember you more like on the Lower East Side is where I really got to know you guys uh, on Foresight Street. So maybe to, uh, to think about uh, where these, these centers of action were and what it was like to be just slightly peripheral to them in, in terms of location, if, if this, if you think, uh, this determined your work or, or psychology of how you were navigating your work in the bigger art worlds? Well, we were, uh, Luis and I had studios on um, Dwayne Street, which is uh, near Al's Gallery, which was near Al's Gallery. Um, we were located between the East Village, with Chinatown East Village, and House Gallery. Hal was the one who initially introduced quite a few artists to each other to that. What was it? What was the show called? Climbing or up and yeah, coming or yeah. something like that. Where I met Judy and a bunch of others, and uh, it was right about that time when the gallery started opening in the East Village. It, storefronts were renting out for something like a hundred dollars a month because uh, a lot of people, shoppers were afraid to go near and uh, all these places that were old or big uh, bodegas had been abandoned and I guess the landlords needed something that could check them. And um, so suddenly, how many galleries within a year, 20 galleries, say 20 galleries popped up, it's more than that, I think. But each gallery having, you know, eight or nine or 10 artists, that's an awful lot of artists and a lot of, awful lot of unique people from all over the world. I mean, all over the world, you know, from everywhere that uh, descended upon New York, made it very interesting each person usually being very unique and there wasn't really a school of the way you do things. Everyone uh, found anything new to be yeah, interesting and fascinating. And uh, especially the openings, there were a lot of openings, right, Carlo? You went to every one. I went to every one, especially the ones with the the beginning. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we were all intermingled and met everyone from the neighborhood and and all of the artists. It's very easy to form a community with that sort of arrangement with all these galleries and artists, hundreds. All fairly young and enthusiastic, so much energy. And everyone worked all the time. And most of the, those that I knew worked all the time on their artwork. It was, it was their life that they um, were really focused with tons and tons of energy and enthusiasm. And people would usually say, you know, go for it. It's encouragement no matter what. Well, you have to think that uh, um, there was a kind of rebellion. There was, there was the Soho and the big galleries and a lot of, uh, well-known artists, and then the young one, many young ones. There was this show in, in the 80s of, uh, on 42nd Street that sort of uh, was making fun of all the, the big artists, you know, they were so, uh, uh, and, uh, and after that, and then you had to think, you know, that people needed a, a cheap place to live. 
And at that time, at that time, it was cheap in the East Village. Then it changed. It became more expensive almost in the East Village. But, you know, people migrated to one, from one side to the other uh, to try to find a place to live and to, and to connect with other people, young people that didn't, they weren't as pompous as so much art that was around at that time, or at least it was considered that, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, yeah, when, when Russell talks about how people could uh, work on their art all the time, part of that was just an economic thing. Uh, Russell, you haven't been in New York in a long time. You might be, uh, might be amused or, or horrified to know that like uh, Tribeca, uh, which was always kind of an interesting alternative to Soho, is now like a booming art district. Uh, Chelsea, we've already mentioned, is, is big, but uh, also the Lower East Side, uh, where where you and uh, Luis lived together, is that's like a huge uh, art district as well. And it's it's very similar in that it's a lot of uh, younger galleries with emerging artists, and basically people. It's the same DIY structure where people are shut out of. Uh, the more established galleries and kind of have to, to do it on their own. Uh, and I, yeah, and I mean, the, I, the difficulty for the artists is the rent. I mean, for uh, the rent in Manhattan, the rent in old New York, I think we, um, we had connections with the city. So we were able to get, you know, three floors of a building on, on uh, Duane Street in Alpha. Uh, $150 and I had a roof garden and uh, that's where the image uh, that you see now with me standing there with the birds which was part of a dance set and uh, we rented actually we rented one floor of the head of from the head of city realty who was always panicking because we were sort of um, unusual and illegal uh, see the stairs <laughs> in the back. So we rented one floor and, and uh, put a hole in the ceiling. And uh, there were two floors above, plus the roof. So those were uh, free amenities. Yeah, and you couldn't we even built get a parking a, a spot. Kitchen for that and now. a bathroom and, you know, everything. I it remember, going, I remember going, going to that building for the first time and being completely blown away by the creative and very imaginative way you and Luis had taken over that building and created for, for yourselves separate studios and the living space and the roof garden. It was just incredible. And it was really the spirit of the times when people came to Lower Manhattan or the, or the East Village and took spaces that were basically derelict and, and vacant and brought them back to life. Uh, so what you did was on, on so many levels, it, it was a great benefit for the two of you, but it was also the, the spirit of, of homesteading a neighborhood that really the city had just written off. Um, yeah, they, were, they stopped renting or using these uh, buildings because they had plans to build a skyscraper in the future. They wanted to put up a new federal building. So first we were down in Wall Street or Pearl Street on Rockefeller's first building to leave because they were going to tear it down. Then to Duane Street, two-story building, really nice. Uh, they were going to put parking lots for that down. And that's when we moved to, Luis was in Spain and the head of city realty was uh, really afraid of Luis because he get hysterical. So when Luis was in Spain, he came to inform me that they were going to be tearing down the building. And I said, what would Luis think? I said, well, he's going to be mad. You know, we ha you have to get us a street, this building down the street, then he would be happy, which wasn't true. <laughs> it wasn't happy. So he arranged, <laughs> the head of city realty arranged to, for us to get this, uh, to these three stories with the roof 
at that price of 150. It wasn't connected to anything, but Luis is very good. He was an architect and an engineer. So he connected um, our building to the gas line and he just popped open something and screwed something in. And we had the electricity. I think my kill there too for firing ceramics and we had a wood burning stove and, and you know, gas heat. <laughs> So the uh, fire department would show up whenever we, well, when we'd start a, start a fire in the winter, but it was like <laughs> grand opera. But we were, we were protected by the head of, he was like an angel, although he was a creep, the head of city, uh, city realty, <laughs> sort of a sleazy guy, obviously, the way he was acting, proved by the way he treated us, which was very well, but because he knew us, he hadn't known us, he would have, you know, sent the police over probably. He and Louise Russell, tell, tell, tell us about the, the pieces that you did for Martha Graham. Oh, um, I had a boyfriend uh, who was the principal dancer with uh, Martha Graham. Uh, you, you know him, he, uh, he did his, own uh, was from uh, Montreal or Jean Louis Moran. But, yeah, Jean Louis Moran. He did uh, uh, quite a bit of work on his own, both in New York and in, uh, he, in Canada, Montreal and uh, Toronto. So I did uh, sets for some of the work in, uh, that he did in both Toronto and Montreal, and also little venues in uh, New York that he did with Terry Capuccilli. And uh, they were very interesting and very strong and very brave. And, and so these were, uh, <laughs> do you remember the piece so much, but it was, he was, of course, with, with Martha Graham, he had that Martha Graham style. And, uh, stylized movement and uh, all these birds are stylized. I had forgotten I had made them until I was digging through my 5,000 pictures and slides and here they are. It, it's gorgeous, They're, Russell, and, and, and so are you in that photo. But I, I do wanna, uh, it, does, uh, it does intrigue me because I, I just did a thing for this museum in the Netherlands with this uh, dancer, Muna Seng, who was Kwang Chi's brother, but she did like a, uh, a dance piece. She's a, a choreographer. She did a dance piece in 1982 with Keith Haring. And, but she came from people uh, basically uh, out of that Martha Graham uh, school. And, and there's a, it's kind of a huge disconnect, uh, I felt, uh, between downtown and this kind of classical modernism. That, that there was there had been a rupture at that time and these were different languages and uh you know in the say in the 60s or even into the 70s if you cared about culture and you didn't go to like abt you were kind of ignorant you know that these these things were were really central to um to the conversation and then like basically lots of uh, what we would kind of call classic modernism uh fell apart uh, uh, in, in the new kind of zeitgeist that the, this young generation was forming. And, and maybe Manuela has uh, ideas about this as well, but like how does this classical language, uh, and Luis was a classicist, how does it relate to this, this really uh, um, kind of degraded form of uh, Arta Povera that, that's sort of emerging directly yeah. from the streets? Well, you have to think that, first of all, there was, Lewis was very close to John Cage and, and Merce Cunningham. And so it was another set of, uh, um, uh, another way of doing dance, okay? Uh, Martha Graham, certainly very classical, but the other one was moving away. And I remember Lewis being very involved and, and probably Russell too, I don't know. Uh, with uh, with this group, you know, uh, and um, I remember uh, meeting. Uh, anyway, 
it, it was a very interesting time uh, to move away from a very big classicism to something new and more, uh, and more, <laughs> and very much different than what it was. Yeah. There's something fresh, you know, after a while. John Cage, for instance, I, were you too, too, you know, close to John Cage or Mars yeah. Hartman? Yeah, I met John Cage in, in Minneapolis at the Institute of Art, and uh, he was doing one of his uh, unusual pieces that I really liked <laughs> on ancient Egyptian writing and Thoreau and various things. And uh, yeah, I think, the, you know. Uh, yeah, the, and I, t I totally fell in love with him. He was with uh, Merce Cunningham, they worked together a lot. Yeah. With the little twinging and twanging of the cactuses, I would go to John Cage's <laughs> performances at the Merce Cunningham studio. And uh, I went with him collecting mushrooms down along the Mississippi when he came to Minneapolis. And he had such a generous spirit and beautiful way of speaking and an inner happiness, that contentment that really came through strongly. And he loved everyone. He really loved young people with their, with their enthusiasm or not. Even those who were not interested, he thought it was He was funny. curious. He was oh, curious, curious. To, know them, to, to follow them, to inspire them in a way, I think. I don't know if he really wanted to do that, but anyway, it was... Uh, I remember when Luis kind of had his falling out with John Cage, or at least the story the way he put it to me, um, because you know yeah. John, was, of course, very interested in chance and, and, and how kind of uh, the poetics uh, uh, yeah. that you could get, uh, almost an I Ching poetics. But I guess John had done this <clears throat> ensemble piece where everyone was supposed to bring an instrument and somehow, uh, through some sort of improvisatory dialogue, uh, create a piece of music. And Luis, I think, brought a tuba and wouldn't stop playing it and just stomped <laughs> all over uh, the, you know, the cagey and silence that of course he always loved to uh, inv invoke. And that John got really mad at him and Luis wouldn't stop. Do you, do you know this story, Russell? No, I don't. I wonder if it's true. I was, it seems yes, like I oh, It's what I remember him telling me. I was like, wow, well, that's told, but then I'm pretty great. Be, that's fairly odd because um, at least normally wouldn't. It seems to me that would be a little bit disrespectful, but I don't know if it's like if you're operating on chance and uh, somebody pops up and does something, you should be you should imagine accept it because it's part of the way chance organizes things very chaotically. But there's I, a base. I think that was Luis's point was was but he was going to be <laughs> a kind of a, a bad chance there. But anyway. No. Because Luis was always very thoughtful and very organized and uh, structured. Everything was very structured. And, and I know he was playing with the I Ching, uh, both with the uh, throwing, tossing of the coins and uh, that sort of thing for a while. And it's, if you can't make a decision, if you just toss the coins and uh, they will tell you what to do, yes or no. Uh, but he was a provocateur too, Luis. He liked to provoke sometimes. Yeah. 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 But but this kind of thing is, is interesting with Luis, like a, just because we have this great uh, shot from Andreas uh, at the pier. And and what I remember from the, I guess it was a Duane Street studio one time visiting that Luis had made, you know, this little ceramic head very small, you know, maybe an inch and a half or something uh, in diameter, if you're gonna to try to measure it that way. And then uh, he was painting it massively uh, on the wall behind him. And you know, of course people know this work, but this ability to kind of uh, scale up and as you say, organize and, and kind of con and control these things uh, from the, the kind of the minutia to the grand gesture, I think was something Luis brought to a lot of us then, I think it was very influential on David Bonarovich, for instance, but uh, 
you know, uh, I don't think this painting, even though he didn't do it that way, I don't think the, the painting we see behind him here would have maybe been as possible if he hadn't figured out uh, how to go from minutia to the grand gesture. Yeah, he was very good at that. He, I, I had to uh, learn to, how to work with play at MIT and uh, he, uh, he started using it as well. And he, he was so good at it from the very start making mostly bust the faces, the heads of um, people and the torsos. So he first make them and build them up in clay and it wouldn't take him very long. And then he also had a, a different tools that are painting machines, he called them. They were grids made out of uh, wire so you could reproduce the, uh, the <laughs> pretty much the exact image. It would be projected behind and you'd have a little circle that he would look through and with one eye and he would, everything would have to line up somehow. It was a little bit complicated in the beginning and for the end he didn't really even have to use it because he was so, so familiar with making these very grand scale pieces. They were like um, big ancient Roman things. Look at how, how grand they are Look for the Colosseum or something. And there he is, you know, he's, he used to be so quiet and gentle. And because uh, he was working all the time on over his desk. But uh, I mean, you, I saw him many times when he would flip because he would reach the end of his rope and uh, disagreement or whatever. And then you had to back off, though he never, with me, he never he got angry. If he got angry with me, I think he took it out on someone else because he was always. We were we were partners, so we took care of each other. And instead of screaming at the other one, we would find some random person. I, I think that seems to be the way it worked. Uh, but he was a kind and gentle person, very intuitive, very spiritual, and also the whole spectrum he covered. He was a humanist and uh, yeah, as well as uh, a Buddhist and a Roman Catholic and everything, a uh, number of things. Yeah, his we sensitivities. Went, he would go to church every, every Sunday, especially when he was ill toward the end, I pushed him over in the wheelchair. And it was a church on Mott Street, which was um, a small Roman Catholic church, but they had changed the sermon. So they had three separate masses, one in Chinese, one in Spanish, one in English. And uh, we went one day and uh, <laughs> the preacher started, it was the Caucasian preacher started pre talking up there and he was speaking in, I don't know what language, mixture of Chinese and English. And uh, Luis was mostly paralyzed at the time and he couldn't really talk. He started giggling because it was really amusing and funny. Everyone was looking as if they understood everything and were taking this seriously, but it was like Latin or Greek. Nobody really understood it. He started, he couldn't stop giggling. So he, had to he said, I don't understand the thing he's saying. So that was all right. But uh, Russell, you... he would meditate. He would meditate every day, and he would. Uh, he was sort of monastic, or um, like he would instead of sleeping in his bed, mm. he would put a mat on the floor, you know, the cement floor, and sleep on that. And also, when he was at MIT, he never. He, he and a musician friend, Marianne Amache, who was avant-garde musician, who recently died and was very brilliant did an apartment in Charlestown, but they always stayed in their studio at MIT on the you know, a sheet on the cement floor with no pillow or anything like that. You don't want to get too comfortable. Whereas I always like to be very comfortable. Well, I was similar to Hal. You are always comfortable, right? Uh, uh, Hal, like I'm curious, I, I, I think you'd probably answer this better than the Manuela or Russell, but because I did love those little small <clears throat> clay sculptures. 
he was making his part of the beautiful. Uh -huh. Were those ever uh -huh. finished uh -huh. works, or was that just part of the process? Um, they were part of the process, but Luis, at a certain point, decided that we could offer them for sale. And so the initial reaction when people would see them would be fairly confused because they couldn't understand what the relationship was between the enormous gestural paintings and these small, very precise sculptures. And then I would show them photographs of Luis putting, putting the little terracotta pieces on a tripod and then using that to scale up the painting behind in the distance. Um, and then people got it. But yeah. a number of them were actually portraits of people, um, relatives and friends. And um, one collector, um, Jane Westman, I remember her husband um, buying the little portrait of Jane and giving it as a, as a gift for her birthday. And of course, she was thrilled and delighted. But, and, um, and he, made, uh, he, he did make images from that as well of uh, Jane, a house of here And um, uh, let's see, she was with Norby at the time, but her, with David, her new husband bought that for her and she was very pleased. It was really beautiful and very strong because she had very strong features and a lot of us artists, a lot of us would uh, go, well, she was a consultant and she loved art, she laughed a lot. And uh, we still would, <laughs> uh, and we would after, you know, two in the morning, we'd say, oh, let's go, let's go visit Jane without <laughs> notifying in advance. And she was always welcoming. And uh, so we'd have a little party there and she, she would, she bought her quite a bit of art. She had a, you know, in her, her apartment on, what was it in the Tudor Villages on 14th Street? It was so much fun and uh, 23rd. I was always yeah. entertaining different artists who would just pop in in groups usually. Yeah. And Russell, here is your work at the pier. What's that? Here are the images, your work at the pier, at the pier, pier 34. Oh yeah, it was just wild, right? That's what it did in your entryway. Uh, the sound of long strokes that I would use you know, my hands or my fingers, but my shoulders, you know, just swooped them around to circles and shapes. Uh, just to have that in the hall of your, I think the, in the entrance to your uh, apartment or on uh, West Broadway. Yeah, that's, yeah, that, that, that was that, that was, was so amazing. amazing. Uh, Luis and I and David, David stopped by. We were living on uh, Dwayne Street, which wasn't far from the pier, and we just hauled all this stuff over, the materials over, and there was a little. A uh, little hole to the wall next to the door, just to push your way through some wire, crawl through with the equipment, in and go in and uh, start working. Luis had a, a roller and a brush at the end of a very long pole that he used to do those. Uh, there was a classic thing he did there with the ball, a ball or a sphere, and uh, the human ship torso and he painted very quickly i mean never got never made a mistake he was on uh, automatic pilot because he was um, familiar with his uh, with what he was doing his arms his whole body knew what to do he didn't think that much after yeah he had thought before figured it out and he would have also these extended brushes, as I remember. So the the, the pier show for those who might be, uh, you know, uh, who, who might not be familiar with it. I, that's actually the first piece of published art writing I ever did was actually writing about the pier show. And Luis and uh, David Vonarovich and Mike Bidlow, I think, were the three who kind of spearheaded it uh, from the beginning. 
uh, or at least that's that's my version of the history. Uh, and it ends up, uh, and, and, and we see Andreas Sterzing um, uh, was, was one of the guys who documented it. It was really the guy who documented it the best. But it ends up being hundreds of artists in an abandoned pier at the end of Spring Street. Um, uh, and, and in the end, you have like, you know, Italian Vogue doing fashion shoots in there, and it was all kind of hellish. Uh, it, it has a, a, a subcultural uh, kind of uh, resonance because the piers at that time had been used as kind of a a site for anonymous uh, hetero, uh, homosexual sex acts and things like that, cruising. So, uh, it, you know, it, it's sort of like, uh, it, it triggered a kind of urban exploration uh, within certain artists and then it was a very generous thing to kind of open it up to other more heteronormative artists and everyone kind of worked in there at the end uh uh but it, it also brings to mind like this odd notion of how collaboration might work then uh in a way that's not like a surrealist exquisite corpse where you're all sharing a canvas so people like Luis and David love the kind of intimacy of collaboration, but uh, maybe you could all, you could both talk about the kind of collaborative instincts at that time. Manuel, I'm, I'm, I'd love to hear more about, you know, uh, you had a window, a kind of a ground floor window in your building yeah. and you open it up to all these, there's, there's David and Kiki Smith uh, working on a uh, collaboration uh, in the window of your building. I know Russell and, and Luis and lots of artists work there. Can, can you talk a little bit about this? How many were there, Manuela? You, you worked with about 50 <laughs> others more. What? Uh, well, it was for seven years that I kept that space. Oh. Well, yeah, the window I started this, I just had an idea because the, the in my building, there was this space rented by a sports good company and they didn't use the window they didn't want anybody to know what was inside and there was this space it looked like a little theater you know this bow window so i went to the guy and i asked uh, may i use the space and he said well sure and for six months with a friend of mine we decided to to say well you know, it's like going to dinner once a week, and then we we make the, the the invitation and we send them out, and we did it. But she left; she went back to Italy. Her name is Vittoria Kerici. And anyway, that was my idea because I had so many friends that were doing work, and I said, "Why not to show it on a, on the street?" Um, so, uh, yeah, it was uh, many artists did the window. Many and what? yeah, we did it for like seven years, right? What, what year did you start, Manuela? I started in '78 when I finished SVA. Wow, that's great. And then there were the friends that finished with me SVA, and I said, Would you like to do this? You know, there is this space. Of course, the first time I went in, I wrote, uh, I cleaned the space and I broke my vacuum cleaner, and that was my only. <laughs> things for the window but I help all the artists that came in and um, and they all were so nice no I mean Sharon did it uh, Russell did it a couple of times and uh, many and Luis too and uh, many they did yeah. I have a long list but you see I was never very good at keeping tracks with everything and I should have had because it would be a very nice. Um, What's book. on the floor of this image? What? What's on the floor in this image? The floor? I, I, I went to collect all the leaves. Ah, okay. Yeah, because David wanted the leaves. So I collected the leaves. Uh, Kiki put up the. the the globe with the hands, and David put the pictures uh, of him, and then he did this drawing. Yeah. Anyway, 
uh, in my building, it was around Christmas and in my building, they wanted to put down the window. <laughs> so I had to fight a little bit, but we kept it up. Mm -hmm. And, and voila, well, uh, did you uh, take, did you take pictures that you record each, each one? It certainly would be interesting to see them all together. You know, if you were, if you changed the window basically once every week for seven years, that's a lot of art. No, 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 every month, every month. Uh, so one would stay for a month. Uh, otherwise it would have been too much, but um, yeah. Seven years, many, many. And uh, Martin Wong, I <laughs> in the window. And I was leaving. This is a funny story. I don't know if it's funny, but. And I said to my husband, please, could you take pictures of the window while I'm gone <laughs> before it comes down? And uh, Martin chose all the medical book that my husband had, and he did a beautiful window. And my husband took the pictures, but he forgot to put the film in. So when I told Martin and he started laughing and he said, that's the best way to take pictures. <laughs> you know how it was. That's great. I'm, anyway, I'm that was a beautiful yeah. window. Beautiful. Because you know he likes bricks and books and so on. And he put it so well, you know. But anyway, that's it. Yeah, well, so, Martin yeah. Sent also the collector in him, you know, you know, so uh, yes, uh, that, that sense of display, which is, of course, very different from David's notions of installation, which yeah, was very inclusive of all sorts of different yeah. things. And this is a uh, pictures. Now we are looking at the pictures. See, uh, David wanted us to go around like the happy family. Okay, and this is uh, Louise, me my son, my second son, and, uh, and the skeleton. And he used to find the most dreary places in New Jersey and have a pictures of the happy family. So that was... <laughs> With a neglected child. <laughs> I have a few. In fact, Marion Shamama sent me some, I think she has many of these pictures. I couldn't find others, but I had one on a, on, on a bridge and many, and many, uh, we used to go quite, you know, we went a few times on Sundays, naturally. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, I've been, I, I'm not sure, uh, I really got, I wanted to ask you about the window, but I, and also talk about the pier, but it, I did want to think about this notion of collaboration and how it didn't always extend to two people working on the same canvas. And if, if that makes Russell or Manuela think of, of anything about the nature of, of collaboration, how certain artists, as I mentioned, Bonarovich, very much so, but uh, also Luis, were really inspired by the possibilities of collaboration. I don't know too much about that because I, I didn't collaborate on paintings. I mean, I collaborated, I guess, with dancers and, and the visuals that would go with dance. But somebody told me that I indeed had collaborated with a few people, but I've forgotten. So uh, maybe it wasn't so pleasant. Well, yeah, yeah. we did a show together. We collaborated on a show together. We also. both did a show at Limbo, right? A Limbo, yes. Limbo was, yeah. Oh, yeah, that was great. That was great. Yeah, yeah. that was good. It, it was fun to do something together. I work with David and Luis on a big canvas that I still have rolled up somewhere. And um, it was fun, you know. The, it was a happening kind of, if you want to think that way. And uh, come over. You know, we do something together a few hours and then we are happy about it. We are glad to do it. Oh, I do this. No, I do this. No, I do that. You know, so it was kind of fun. It was a release from many other problems that everybody had at that time, especially. Yeah. And, so uh, I remember um, David, when we did the show in 1983, um, 
he wanted to do collaborations with a lot of people. So Luis and Mike Bidlow came in during the installation and they, the three of them created a little painting on a um, horseshoe crab. And then Kiki Smith was invited to come in and she and David did um, drawings on sheets, bed sheets um, with their blood. And in fact, when we had the um, David and Luis show a few years ago, um, I asked Kiki if we could borrow any of those for the show. And she discovered that although she had saved them, they had been destroyed in the Hurricane Sandy flood because they were below grade oh. and, and had been underwater and were unfortunately thrown out. Um, yes, and the, the, of course, Carlo, the peer, was the height of collaboration. You know, I mean, everybody was collaborating with everybody there in a, in a very broad sense. Although, as we've already seen, you could, you could easily find each artist's work sort of on the edge of another artist's work without overpainting out the other work. It, it, there was a great sense of egalitarian kind of um, sharing of space there at the pier, which was extraordinary. No respect. Yeah, no. yeah I respect, think that, you exactly. Know, yeah, yeah it, which is also like a graffiti code for public art. You know, that uh, you're welcome up on the wall, but you don't go over anyone else's work because you can get a beat down, which was not our world, but uh, uh, that kind of <laughs> vengeance. But uh, I mean, to me, there was always a really interesting alchemy. I remember at the kind of when we were all really sick of East Village, especially as like a kind of a title, you know, which really had worn out its welcome for any of our lives uh, as a category. I got asked to do this show. These sweet kids in Virginia had this alternative space and they asked me to do an East Village show. And I was like, well, I, I'm not shipping work. I, I'll bring down some artists. So, and I, I, if I can remember correctly, Luis was there. David was there. I think Christoph Kohlhofer and Marilyn Minter, James Romberger, Marguerite Van Cook. I can't remember. There's a bunch of uh, David West. Uh, anyway, a bunch of artists there, and everyone took acid and kind of destroyed the place. But it was it was a beautiful thing. So I, I did like uh, when we could uncork those kind of energies uh, together. It was it was pretty good. I remember uh, that. I remember that story, Carlo. <laughs> yeah. It must have been a pretty amazing show. <laughs> yeah. And oh, and Tessa was there. I can't remember. It was it was it was a lot of people. Uh did a lot of too. I think Judy Glansman, right? And maybe Judy was there. I can't remember. Uh well, I was on acid. Why should I remember? Were you there, Russell? I don't no. think Russell came on that. No. So uh, Bobby yeah. has a Bobby G has a question. Oh great. Did, when did Luis and, and David meet? And Russell, I remember you, you and David and Luis were all very close friends um, over time, but I don't remember when any of you met. I think it was in, in 80, around 83 when you had maybe 82. Uh, it have to be at least 82. Yeah. And um, it was interesting because uh, they started working together. David was, well, soon after, he said, after the epidemic started, David became extremely political and he was on the news, he was an activist. And when did the HW thing start? It, it switched everything around, it put a different color onto the whole scene but uh but we have it by 81 but when everyone started dying and when it starts getting you know it stops becoming grid and becomes aids in terms of nomenclature that's that's later it's 84. because it, uh, david uh i saw a couple of interviews with him from the media the new york media and it was on youtube and he was so articulate and so angry which made perfect sense. But uh, Luis was never, I read somewhere that he was very political. He was not political at all. And they, as far as the, the epidemic went, he liked to uh, sort of deny it. 
and he was a macrobiotic it, uh, and uh, but he certainly wasn't hiding anything he would answer any question but but uh, he, he wasn't a person who would go out with the mob on the street and go rah, rah, you know, down, down, out, but, you know, scream in unison. It would be totally against his nature. Same with David, probably, but David was really good at articulating very true and human feelings about the way this community was being ignored and uh, he got his point across very strongly. I don't know if it's ever, I saw the interviews sort of live. I don't know, they were recorded. I don't know if they go, went onto the different channels or not, but. Uh, well, he, his rage was righteous. And I think uh, if you look at the entirety of his work, it, it certainly also predates AIDS though. Um, the, the kind of, you know, the president who wouldn't even say the word AIDS out loud, uh, you know, all, all those things like that, uh, the marginalization and, and lack of concern really did motivate his later art. I wonder, Russell, if, if you think, you know, Luis being from Argentina, which of course has a, a long history of, of kind of dictatorial uh, suppression of, of free speech, if, if that would have, or if that was just Luis's personality. It was Luis's personality. I mean, he didn't uh, he didn't really allow other people to to establish his boundaries. I mean, he was pretty fearless, really. But that was a world he didn't he didn't go into the world of any type of activism, where he, he was interested in art. That's all he was active in, and he was active in the community, and. Uh, yeah, he wouldn't join a mob. Is that the right yeah. word? Well, it, it's it's funny uh, for me to think about that because I'm I'm doing a show at a museum in China now, and uh, you know AIDS is always sort of the elephant in the room. You have to address it, but I've always been wary of the ways people kind of clump together everyone who died of AIDS together in some like morbid little room onto its own or or just some of the ways of that. And um, I'm borrowing from Hal some of the late paintings uh, that Luis did of the candles and of the watches. And to me, uh, there's so frail, so poetic, so much about, um, uh, you know, mortality and loss. And yeah, yeah, there's one here, you know, uh, and, and I'd almost half forgotten about them because you know, Luis is dying compared to the kind of the scope and grandeur and, and kind of heroic nature of desire that motivated his work. They're, they're just uh, these flickering flames and these watches kind of ticking down in, in these in small paintings, but lost in a void of solitude. And, and I think that to my mind, like, you know, just as we look, look at art after Stonewall, we, you know, we also have to consider art after AIDS. And to my mind, there's some of the most beautiful expressions of that. Um, I don't know what Manuela and, and Russell, you know, you would remember that work when Luis was doing it. Um, oh, yes. I have some, yeah, beautiful, beautiful work. But that was Luis nature, you see. He was very reserved. He was, uh, a solitary in a way, although he liked, uh, you know, to get together with other people and so on. But, but he was a, a very thoughtful and uh, he liked to meditate. He liked to philosophize about his life or life in general. And um, yeah, this is so much Louise, these paintings, these uh, candles, and especially, I think he saw that his life was uh, finishing in a way. And, uh, and maybe and he, was, was, he, he was expressing time in many, on many levels. I think before he, absolutely. before the epidemic, the, one of the pieces was the constellations. I remember, I think you yes. have them, the stars, which is a, uh, universal time somehow and uh, 
the candles, which uh, it's a series of 12. So you have the candle at one, two, three, four, and by the 12 is sort of this, and then the next one has a little bit of smoke. It's out with the smoke. And uh, the, other the other body of work was the, the watches. You have a couple of them there, you know, the watch way on the bottom and it goes from the top to the bottom with the, it's a little golden watch. And uh, that you see is, is just time. And there are a few other, this series that will uh, suggest that. And uh, yeah, he was, uh, if he was aware of his demise or his imminent demise, I don't, he, he didn't focus on it really. I mean, I lived with him and he would always, you know, no, there's no problem if you get it, you're fine. You're healthy, yeah, don't, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. And he had this, that same sort of, he had the sense somehow that, mysterious sense that if you, if you admitted that something was, something uh, destructive was happening to you, uh, that that would sort of fertilize it and help it to grow. So that it was denial was a big thing. And of course, if you deny horrible things, you begin to feel better, I suppose, if, you, if you're able to bury it deeply. But it, comes out somehow, seeping out. Uh, By 88, he's uh, already diagnosed though, right? He knows he's dying at this point. I remember when I told him, I had I have a story, I would, had some hairy little plaque on the side of my tongue and I went to the dentist here in the, well, I went to the dentist and he wouldn't see me because he, he had a hunch that it might be related to, to age, his name was Dr. Puller. And so he, he sent me to a special a math specialist in another town here. And they, after scratching the head for quite a while, they suggested that the problem was that my tongue was too big. And maybe they would have, you know, cured the HIV by making my tongue smaller, but I didn't uh, allow them to do that. But my dentist in New York knew immediately what it was and, um, and you know, put me on medication, which always worked for me, but nothing ever bothers my digestion. Some people would get so sick on the first AZT was the first treatment and they couldn't take it, but I could have eaten, gobbled it up like, Cheerios in the morning and yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah, when I told Luis that maybe he should get tested, that I had been tested and I was positive, he blew up. And he didn't blow up with me often, he blew up with other people. He said he, he got really angry as if I was committed committing suicide by acknowledging that the test showed there's a problem here. And he never went in for a test. And the doctors at the time in New York said, you know, two, two years maximum with the symptoms that I had. And luckily, um, this, our scientist came around and uh, figured this out. So here I am. They miss it not, they, they missed it by at least, you know, 30 years. Oh. I, I, I squeezed 30 years out of a two year max. Mm -hmm. Your personality too, Russell. I think Luis was much more uh, sad about everything, you know. And I think he he took everything upon his shoulder. He never wanted to talk about it. And no, he would. Yeah, I. I, I, I like smart ass, I think. Yeah. Well. Very serious. But we can say something nice about the East Village. We had the East Village Orchestra. Keiko Bonk, yeah. do you remember? No, there was, uh, 
the great thing about the, that time I remember is a, a, a general willingness for all of us to make absolute fools out of ourselves. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, it, I know that's a bit of a put down, but I think that uh, um, the, the stakes can be so high now that no one really wants to be uh, look totally foolish. Uh, and, and that's a little inhibiting. And I, and I think uh, uh, people are, have to be a lot more sensitive about what they say and about the entitlements they bring in the world. And we were, you know, uh, genuinely uh, oblivious. And, and I think that was a nice thing. I think that first photo uh, we had were, uh, that we were looking earlier with, with David in it. Um, I think that was like from when Mike Bidlow did the factory at PS1 or something. And that was this uh, crazy party. I mean, you don't need to go back to it, but um I love that I Ching uh, painting as well. Oh, let's look. Let, let, well, while we're on the, let's look at the this project you did in Miami because I wasn't totally familiar of it, and it, it's got a. Or, yeah, this is this is actually in New York, so this is great. Um, this yes. is the thing we were talking about where you cleared out. Uh, yeah, B and Eleventh. You see all the raw material there. It's like a lumber yard. Yeah. Uh, and, and it really is kind of. Uh, there was a lot of, you know, there wasn't just squatting. There was a lot of occupation of spaces from Manuela's window to the rise of community gardens, which had started beforehand, but then a lot of artist gardens and, and, and things like that. So uh, and there wasn't that openness in that kind of vacancy of a, an abandoned city, uh, a, a, a sense of a playground, I, I thought. Yeah, yeah, it was play uh, people really really enjoyed it and it was uh, not a commentary on anything but uh, playfulness and uh, uh, yes I was always interested. But Russell in nothing's more uh, radical than play actually <laughs> it's one of the most radical things we can bring. I was always interested in having fun and point in yeah. living in uh, a world that was delightful and, and that's why I never was I guess that's being being political but it wasn't interesting and I couldn't as David could put these feelings of anger and uh, politics in, into his work so brilliantly I can yeah it wouldn't work for me and uh, and Luis's work is always so classical he wasn't really a big commentary on any of the humanity he was a Humanist as was his entire family. It was like a family of saints, his dad, his mother, his uh, brothers, and his sister, Leah, who was with us here. Really, really beautiful, kind, and decent people and encouraged. They all encouraged Luis. Luis's brother was an uh, uh, architect and uh, his uh, mother and her family from Winnipeg were artists, and uh, and Luis's mother said, and she she was elderly at the time, and it's a pretty conservative country. She when she or somebody told her that Luis was was a homosexual, she, she said, "Well, well." You know, all great artists are homosexuals. That's what she dealt with it just off the top of her head. And it was so reaffirming to him and so encouraging. And of course, everyone else followed, except for a certain uncle and some other people in his family. Then. When you did the Soul Spirit, the East Village, was this, this was before we did the commission in, at the Miami Art Museum, wasn't it? So, yes, I think it was just before that. I think they saw, they probably saw that and the little Maketsa had done and yeah. then decided to, uh, to commission Katie, that. Could we see the, uh, some of the Miami pictures? The, the, yeah, yeah, that's so this is the, the, the courtyard with the ladder on the left. Um, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. That that was one of the pieces, and we have a little maquette in our current show of that of that ladder, um, and then 
in the other pictures, we see some of the other works that were there. Yeah, and you see the colors. Basically, I used uh, the primary colors. I wanted, I was looking at the Mayan art and, and South American Indian art. And so it influenced me someone. I thought it was fun and a good idea for Miami where there were a lot of Latinas and I always admired them. And in one of these, you will see the two-headed dragon that it was yeah, uh, sort of that's as beautiful <laughs> that it represents the lightning with the <laughs> the rain, so the lightning sitting on top of the <laughs> the rain. So it was huge. Yeah, the scale of those works was so marvelous. It was and really the lighter. Great. The lighter was colorful too. It, it, they were taken, the pictures were taken, that one anyway, with the ladder was taken at night. So it appears to be just plain wood, but see the color of this uh, lightning bolt. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, um, it's, it's great to see Russell because I mean, I, I do get a sense also uh, that it hasn't moved that far from the urban detritus from, you know, from which your garden in New York grew. Uh, but uh, I've, I've, I've always been interested a little in, in kind of how you, you came to the city and you were still kind of very much uh, painting from memory and from feeling, uh, from heart uh, of, about the natural settings. You know, you were kind of like this, this rugged Midwestern guy in our midst and, and doing these kind of nature paintings. The colors got probably more extreme maybe out of the city but you know now you're back in in nature and you have been for a really long time you're i think in minnesota right and uh and i'm curious like how if, as you kind of look back at your life and your work how do you relate your your tenure in new york and that because you know we think of it so much of the art of that time as being so unmistakably urban you know, Luis painting rats on garbage can lids and things like that. It's like, uh, how do you relate, you know, how do you think about this in the scope of your work? Is it an anomaly or is it contiguous? Is it an, an anomaly or contiguous? The, it, it, uh, let's see, a oh, story. Judy Gonsman had, you know, urban artists and one day, I remember, she had done a show of, really heavy industrial doors, metal doors, normal size, normal size, it's a big door. I came walking home with the, uh, she would paint faces and images on them, which was so delightful, but the work was really heavy, literally. I came walking home with, uh, to the studio with Juan and Luis's, what are you gonna, what are you gonna do with that door? We had about 500 pounds in it, I don't know, it's somehow it vanished, but it was certainly a wonderful door and she had done about 20 of them, I think. And Louise was painting on automobile, wreck, the doors of automobiles. And uh, I would, well, like these I would turn, it was just junk from the street, but it was wood, shattered wood and I would, uh, get out the hatchet or whatever, smash it up and then piece it back together. Uh, yeah, I was, let's see. So I, I grew up on a farm where I am now in Minnesota. I've been spending, I have a studio in Miami Beach and I do a lot of, did a lot of work there, summers here. And uh, so my story, I, I love the far I love the trees in the country more than the people know it than anything else. You no, know, it was an early tree worshiper and nature worshiper. Went to uh, needed to get away. So I at 18 I studied went to study in Mexico City. So I was there for three years and then I came back, had a job as a chemist for a while here in Minneapolis and then moved to Boston for a couple of years where I met Louise and then we moved together to uh, New York City in 1974. So I had a lot of influences in the colors I suppose from uh, 
I don't know, they were primary colors. So they looked like the Mayans that the, the Aztec used and, uh, and all the ancient cultures, the primary colors, the Greeks, the Egyptians, everyone. And it was heavy, you know, thick and, and primitive looking. A lot of, a lot of the, the work, they did paintings with sticks on them and that, that sort of thing. So, yeah, and Tyler, you, rec you recognize the earthiness of it all, because as I was telling Katie yesterday, I remember having lunch with you, I think it was at Limbo, and you told me, yes, you, you, you were talking, and you said, oh yeah, you're just like a sack of potatoes, and that was so perfect, because it's so earthy, well, it looked it's more earthy than a sack of potatoes, but I, I told Katie, but you know, it didn't really look like a sack of potatoes, but that's what it felt like. That's funny. <laughs> and I that. So it, it, uh, it uh, my work changed uh, quite a bit, but I noticed in artists work, every artist's work changes uh, somewhat, some, like Agnes Martin, not too much, but. Uh, the same, you recognize the same spirit running through the work, no matter how abstract your representation and all it is, the, the spirit is, is a line. It, 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 uh, you can recognize the, I can, especially with people I'm familiar with, if I see one of their paintings, somewhere if it's really an unusual unique one you can see their spirit in it with their hand or the touch mm -hmm. can you can show us some of the other paintings in the show where we see your your sense of uh color your bright colors and then softer colors these that we're seeing oh here yeah i did the monochromatic show uh, this, uh, yeah, this is a wax medium. I did it quite a few and showed them up the street from here to different galleries, so Hazen Gallery. Yeah, they're really, I loved working with that wax, wax medium. And these are all landscape, you know, depictions of landscape or suggestions. Some of them are, Really abstract, but just to use you know one or two colors was uh, yeah those are small. I did some larger ones, uh, five feet by five feet. These are foot by foot, as you can see in the bottom. Two thousand and well, oil on canvas is oil mixed with wax. Uh -huh. That the one on the left almost looks Italian. Hey, what? The one on the left almost looks like an Italian landscape. It does, doesn't it? With the with the the, the row of the Italian trees. What kind of trees are there? They're beautiful. You see them everywhere in Europe, especially in Italy, in the landscape. Manuela will tell us. It depends what region. <laughs> it's very different from one region to another. You know, but definitely, yes, they're wonderful. Yeah. I have some of these uh, uh, small uh, work of uh, Russell. Small work. My task anywhere. When I, um, I was putting together, I was just painting paintings, uh, uh, two square, you know, two feet by two feet. And I had a whole body of work. And then uh, a gallery from Italy uh, talked to me and asked me if I could do a show, but uh, representing parts of Tuscany. Um, oh. His name was Raphael something or another, Tuscany. So uh, I said, sure. And the next day, someone, a couple came in, a mother and her son, and she looked at the work and she said, what does this remind you of? And her son said, oh, Tuscany, they had just been there. So I had all the work painted and these people came in. Then the curator of this 
uh, gallery in, in Florence wanted me to do Shaw Tuscany and the next day this couple came in and said the work that I had already done reminded them Tuscany. They had just returned so the work was there and I just changed, changed the names into Italian and that was that. It's very easy. Nice. But they were the golden colors, the beautiful rich colors. This is a nice painting, isn't it? These look like birch trees, Russell. Yes. It probably is. Yes, everywhere I look, I see birch trees here. Or, or uh, aspen, we have a type of, it's called popple tree here, poplar, and it has a white bark too, but that's uh, uh, birch. I have like 10,000 little, little and big birch trees on my farm. It's being overrun by birch trees, which I don't mind at all. I'll send you each one if you like. <laughs> send you a coupon. You can come and get it. Well, good. Um, are there any more questions or I, uh, are we good? Carlo, you um, know. <coughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. If people have questions who are who are watching, um, I saw one earlier, Manuela, that someone was asking you if Luis and Martin Wong were friends. I, uh, I, don't, I, 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 I don't know. Really. I don't know. Yeah, they knew I, each other. Uh, I'm sure they knew each other. I know uh, for whatever reason, though, his gallery, their, their gallery wouldn't like me to say it since they represent both the states, but. I know David and Martin didn't actually get along, um, but that's this, you know, how sometimes. Oh, I'm talking about Martin Wong and David Von Roach weren't really very tight. Uh, oh, well, you know, they Martin, were both. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I always think it has to do with food because David liked to eat all the time, and so did Martin. <laughs> Martin talked to him. Well, and I tell you, David was surrounded, especially in the last years of his life, was surrounded by. A group of people, and they were uh, uh, well, very you know. It's, I don't think they included a lot of other people. Yeah, that happened. He was very, they were protective. I mean, I remember going to see David when he was almost dying. Actually, I saw him a few days before he died. Um, and I always had to ask permission, and so on. And David was so happy. You know to, that I would stay there, and uh, anyway. Uh, so I don't know with Martin. Martin, I sort of uh, after the the window, and you know, seeing each other once in a while because he had he knew people that I knew too. So um, he was always cheerful and nice, and uh, but nothing much, you know, nothing. I mean, I don't know about his relationship with David. Maybe other people say a lot of things about people, you know, yeah. that they really don't know sometimes. Behind you is a picture of, of Russell Sharon. It's from his swimmer series. I can't remember the year, but those were early 80s, weren't they, Manuel? Oh, yes, even seven. With Carlo, I did a show in Milano where Russell and Louise and many, many others were there. Yeah, David Von Roach was in it. And David was there. I carried the head yeah. on the plane. Yes. Graffiti artists. It was really fun. It was, uh, that was early. I was in Milano and what was that, 83 or something? 84. 84. 84. Yeah, that was a really good time. Uh, uh, very interesting architects, artists, collector, whatever. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, is he still with us, Manuela, uh, Corrado? Uh, yes, he's 93 and painting. Uh, but, yeah, uh, you know, I don't know much about it, you know. It's just, uh, he's doing well, I think. He's, he's like, <laughs> he's a monster. <laughs> oh, uh, Russell, we have an interesting one from you, uh, one for you here. Somebody said that uh, they uh, read somewhere that in the late seventies that you and Luis collaborated on making handbags with animal motifs. Oh yes, we had when we were in Boston. We uh, designed them. I, I met Luis one night when he was. 
I was out late, so we said very young, and uh, sitting on a step of a barber shop, and here comes this person down the street with an elephant, and uh, it was interesting, and it uh, was Ruiz. So we, it was an elephant that he had made on as luggage with wheels, so he could you know, walk with it. And he was walking back from MIT across the bridge and then to Charlestown with this elephant in the middle of the night. And uh, he was leaving for Buenos Aires the next day. So we uh, talked for a while and then he uh, went on his way without me. I decided to stay back. But uh, we, so he had, he had designed this, the piece of luggage on wheels. And so when we, we were thinking of moving to New York, we started designing little, these little tote bags. I have some here and I had, did I send an image of, of those that we had designed? And uh, yes, they were very nice. And we made a fairly de decent amount of money couple of years, you know, how somebody would come in and work or deliver pieces to the to the projects of the east side. We, and uh, we'd sell them to uh, Smithsonian Magazine, Smithsonian shop and a bunch of bodegas and some magazines and never get yeah, hundreds of them. So I could grab a sheet and show you what they looked like. I also wanted to say that Luisa's last show was uh, put on by uh, Gracie Manson and it was uh, not long before he died and there were extremely beautiful small uh, pieces done on you know, typing paper. He was not in good physical shape. He was in very good mental shape, but they couldn't communicate. But he could, he, it was so difficult for him to move. And uh, he did make, I don't know, about 30 or 40, 40 of these very innocent looking drawings. They were, they were childlike, remember how? And yeah, uh, those were great. the last work. And so we went, Gracie, I don't think it was in her, it wasn't in her gallery, but it was a place that she had found somewhere. And uh, I, we took Luis in a van in a wheelchair and he was very happy with it. And. Uh, Everyone was very happy to see him, but everyone was able to connect with him one more time. And uh, he was so strong and so brave and would not give up. And uh, so he did, he painted until the very end and kept him going. So. And uh, I have a few, I meant to send you one help, but there uh, are several, but. Uh, he didn't. They're very extremely beautiful, just lines, lines. And uh, yeah, that's that. Uh, we have a question from um, Mike Etner in Washington. And Katie, if you unmute uh, Mike, he can ask that. I'm going to go grab a couple of things that would disappear from the picture. Did the... Can people hear me now? Yes, yep. we can hear you. Oh, Thank you. oh great. Hey, hey, uh, I'm sorry I showed up later on this, but um, there was another episode that I, I've heard about. Uh, this question is for Russell. Russell, hi, how, how are you? Um, that uh, Russell, there was a, a point in the mid '80s when Sylvester Stallone, uh, the Hollywood actor of all people, uh, visited uh, Luis's studio. Uh, were, were you around that day? And if so, it must have been wild. Uh, you know, Russell's just stepped uh, away for one second. He wants to do a show and tell for us. I do remember when that happened. Uh, I remember uh, Sly was visiting a lot of artist studio, and I remember. Luis, I, I don't remember much of what he said about it, like as an incident, but I, I remember 
that Luis didn't like uh, Stallone's paintings because Sylvester's <laughs> painted them. And so it was perfectly comfortable because it's always easier when it's mutual admiration. But I'm sure when Russell gets back, wherever he's foraging or maybe milking the cows out there, uh, he'll, he'll let us know. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, he bought a lot of work from a lot of people downtown then. Uh, do you ever sell him anything, Hal? I didn't, no. I, I think when you're famous, you can just go straight to the artists and you can cut the dealers out of the deal is probably part of it. <laughs> uh -oh. And the other question, and maybe Carla, you might know this, uh, for Russell is, did he and uh, Luis periodically visit all the great museums of the city, uh, the Met and MoMA and, and others? I imagine they did. Uh, I think we all did. I mean, museums were cheap then. And you know, the great thing about museums then is they were so damn intimidating to the rest of the world. They were, you know, and all the reasons that are under criticism now is that um, because the discrete forms of exclusionary behavior, but I think we, we all treated museums in New York like our sanctuary. Russell, we have a couple questions here for you. Mike, do you want to ask him uh, again? Sure. Hey, hey, Russell, how are you? This is, uh, my name's Mike. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I've, I've heard, heard the story from other people now that uh, Sylvester Stallone, the Hollywood actor, uh, the uh, most famous for the boxing uh, uh, role of boxer, boxer in the Rocky series, uh, that he stopped by Luis, Luis's uh, studio in the mid 80s. At, were you were you at home? Were you around at that time? Who are we talking about? I didn't hear. Oh, well, Sylvester, the, Stallone. So, Sylvester Stallone. Oh, that was when we were we were on Forsyth Street. No, no. I uh, I wasn't there that day. It was probably in the summer when I I was I spent summers here in the farm and in my farm in Minnesota. And uh, yeah, he caught by in a limousine with the, with his consultant. Is um, yeah, and uh, I don't know if he was uh, Stallone was collecting art at the time, putting together a collection. I'm not sure what he chose, but uh, did he also go to the gallery? How where you had a bunch of Lucy's work? No, I, I wasn't there. Uh, he may have come to the gallery, but. Um, Mike had another question about um, whether you like to visit museums, Russell. If I like to visit museums? Mike will yeah. ask you. Yeah, uh, I, I'm intrigued by the museum going habits, uh, either, you know, none or, or few visits or a lot of business visits of, of you, Russell, and Luis at that time. Um, was that something you periodically did, uh, walk up or take the subway up to the Met or, or Museum of Modern Art? Yeah, I went very, I went very often to the Met and the uh, Whitney and, uh, you know, uh, not very often, but it would see every show. And uh, the Met, I mean, what a great museum. I mean, it's like all of history. And uh, just wash, wander through. It's like taking a spiritual bath. I would, I would tend not to stop at many paintings, but once in a while, and and lose myself in them. But just walking through it, uh, it's uh, walking through the past, you know, I mean, three thousand years, and it's somehow like a cleaner when I would leave. Instead of taking a shower, I would do that. Just joking. <laughs> that's, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Something Russell. That, yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Russell, we didn't see that. Can you show us again? Oh, I thought this was interesting because it's it relates to the other, the, the Mr. Minnie Mouse and Mickey Mouse. And uh, New York, London, Chicago, the, uh, here's his, uh, somebody who he met in, in uh, London. <laughs> this is so funny. He did a series of uh, 
these paintings with a, a, a lot of rats, you know, Mickey Mouse and some of his rat friends. And Luis always did studies uh, like this for larger pieces. Carla, remember the, corner, the corners in East Village once in a while, Luis would do huge um, yeah. faces. And the construction and states. They were so, so remarkable. Well, I, I mean, I, and I do think there, there was a, a you know, an interesting uh, thing that happened in New York then because <clears throat> graffiti was such, had such an impact on people with studio practices uh, because we were sort of living in this black and white or deep gray world. And then yeah. the trains would roll through and it'd be this like kind of technicolor marvel. And you saw a lot of artists, you know, Luis, whatever, you can talk about herring in the same way, uh, basically uh, inspired by that, not trying to be graffiti artists, but, or whether it's Jenny Holzer or Barbara Kruger, lots of people started working on the streets. And it was sort of like uh, joining in on a conversation uh, of public art without all that, you know, like what you experience is trying to do something in a vacant lot without all the bureaucracy and all the, the kind of horrible ways that corporate art uh, in public spaces or bureaucratic decisions of civic things is creates the worst art. So there was, I think, uh, a license that was given to artists to engage with the streets, to engage with an audience that um, uh, didn't go to galleries or museums uh, to kind of, you know, mix into the deeper into the fabric of the culture. And, I, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, even a, we talked about the peer shows, so some of these kind of uh, ways of, of, of reclaiming uh, space were, were all part of something which had happened organically amongst kind of inner city youth in, in the decade beforehand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, it was, it, it, things would happen organically. Somehow there's a seed or a few seeds together and grow and tangle up and, and become almost one. And it was really these organic or wild growth, feral growth was so beautiful. The, the connections were spontaneous. And who was the mayor at the time? Because it, there was a beam, was it? When it was, it was beam, yeah. No, um, there should have been anything. Unless you're went. thinking back to Lindsay, but it's probably beam. Yes. Uh, or Koch. Maybe you're thinking of Koch in the 80s. It could have been. Koch. It could have been Koch. And uh, suddenly it was, the, the picture was on for a while. I know the image of the Reese and his work in that room. You see the clutter on the floor. It looks like the dirt and the dust and the boards are built up. And someone brought some grass seed and threw it around for oat seed. And you know, in a few weeks, that was all green. It could have somebody could have brought the lawnmower and <laughs> trimmed it, but it was uh, it became very fresh from being very dusty to this fresh little green grass, which of course half the ceiling was out. So it was one of the early ones that, there, you see, looks like, I don't yeah. know, mulch on the floor. In about a month, that was, you know, beautiful, beautifully softened by green grass, or, you know, that grew from some seeds that people had strewn about. But, other parts of the pier, there was just natural growing weeds. Nature was taking yeah, over. Thing. It was a great, uh, I can't remember her name now, a really interesting woman artist who painted a wheat field, uh, planted a wheat field in lower Manhattan, a really functioning wheat field. But I do think uh, with this kind of abandonment and uh, this dereliction and this kind of disuse of space, it did create incredible, not just opportunities, but um, what was maybe a little 
in New York's favor a little different than some other American cities that were also collapsing at that time was just how much history, how much residue of that history uh, existed. You know, so if we're thinking of like the Lower East Side, we're talking about generation after generation after generation immigrants, each leaving behind a sense of flavor. But when you're talking about the pier, you're talking about all, you know, not just the original use of the pier, but then all these kind of subsequent uses where, uh, and I know Vonarovich was very, you know, interested in like finding files from like psychiatric clinics had been dumped there. Of course, bodies got dumped there, but uh, you know, that artists were, were not, it was abandonment, but they weren't working on a blank canvas. It was a very rich kind of tapestry of, uh, uh, of histories uh, that, that we were all occupying at that time, at least in me. And there's something very romantic and extremely exquisite and beautiful about that sort of well, canvas that that sort of Robert chose to work with. It, uh, it inspired me a lot. It inspired yeah. many other and, people. You see a, a ruin like this, and most the mob would say, you know, tear it down. It's junk, dirty, you get sick. But you can see it, and um, if you're seeing it from a different part of your soul, you say, "Oh my God, there's a lot of raw material there. It's so beautiful as it is, and uh, it's very brave to try to make it more beautiful. Or actually, make it more beautiful as Luis did. Look, the whole thing fits perfectly. The images work with the floor. It's all the same. It pulls the whole thing together." And uh, here are some of the, <laughs> here are the, the, the bat, those hand rags that we had designed in different shapes. That was in oh, 1976, I think, because Bloomingdale, it was a year of uh, presidential campaign. So suddenly these elephants and donkeys appeared, and lots of them in Bloomingdale's Russell, window. Who, Russell, who was selling those? Who were you was, making them for? We made them for like, you know, a couple hundred for Bloomingdale's and they sold them, but they had them in the windows decorations during the Carter was running against whoever for, uh, Ford. And so they would choose a donkey, which represents the Democrats, as you probably know, and the elephants, the other ones. The Republicans. And, didn't, and weren't, weren't, weren't you also making them for um, a company so that's sort of a... I'm sorry, I, I interrupted you. No, go um, ahead. We, we made them for uh, Smithsonian in Washington in their catalog, basically for their catalog, but they also have gift shops. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing if you want to sell something, anything, get it in a catalog, everyone buys. It. I mean, and there were canvas, different colors, beautifully done. And, uh, you know, loose, mo mostly canvas. And uh, I think this, some unusual, you know, like that, easy. Uh, there's a sheep, an elephant, a crocodile, another elephant, pig, dog, yeah. So those, so those are all little works of art floating around out in the greater world now. Yeah, I've where they all are. seen them. Um, You're talking like a dealer, Hal. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a question. We have a question. Was Luis? A, a pioneer with Atari video games. No, no, no. Okay, um, this has been wonderful. I think uh, we probably, um, unless we have more questions, we should probably wrap things up. And Carlo, you were mentioning the wheat field. Uh, that was one of the projects done by. Um, Art, art, on the, the art on the Beach series at Battery Park City. Yeah. Um, and I think the, the sponsor was the Public Art Fund. Yeah. I remember Rosemary Castoro and Jody Pinto both did works 
Yeah, yeah I can't remember the artist who did that, but she's like a kind of an earthwork artist who's been overlooked a bit and yeah. really, really good. I liked it when there was just a beach. I used to go there and have sex. <laughs> what could be better than that? Yeah, I mean, in Manhattan. Now you have to order it as a drink in a bar. Never mind. They were very okay. accommodating at that time. So much fun. Love you guys. Well, thank you all so much. Um, it's really great to, to share this history with uh, with everyone. Thank you, Manuela. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, Carlo. And um, we'll see you again soon. Um, we have some more talks coming up, so looking forward to those. And everyone have a good day. You too. Thank you so much. Huh? Thanks, Katie. Thank you, Katie. You're so brilliant. You, you explain everything so well and tell my no fingers where what buttons to press. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you don't get frustrated. You, if you do get frustrated, you manage to cover it really well. You have so much patience and you're so brilliant. Thank you. No problem. I'll see you guys later. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.